It's been long enough. Here's our review of the Nintendo Switch. Welcome to It Came From A Box, I'm Sergio I.M. We've now spent over a month testing out the Nintendo Switch, and I have to say it's a very compelling console. There's a lot to it. When it was first announced, I was beyond excited. This is what I wanted to see from Nintendo, but I was also worried about a few things. Being that it's a hybrid device, I had no idea how powerful it was really going to be. The price point was a bit higher than expected, a lot of other questions, but now that it's in my hands, I have to say, for the most part, those worries have been put to rest. As with all our reviews, this video is split up into sections, which you can view in the description below. So make sure to check that out, and here we go. So here's the console. It looks just like a thick tablet. It's lightweight and made of a sturdy plastic that can hopefully survive a few drops. On the front, we have a 6.2 inch 720p multi-touch LCD display. Everything on it looks nice and crisp. Colors are vibrant and brightness levels are great, but outdoors, you won't be able to see much of anything in direct sunlight. You're gonna have to hand shade it. At the top, we first have the power button and a volume rocker. A little bit more to the right, air vents for the fan. It does get a little noisy depending on what kind of game you're playing. Then we have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and the game card slot. On the back, we have some intake vents and the micro SD card slot, which is covered up by this little kickstand. The kickstand's a bit flimsy in use, but it gets the job done, and fun fact, it's designed to snap off instead of breaking. This time around, Nintendo ditched the proprietary charging method for a USB-C port at the bottom. That location allows it to connect to the dock, but the problem is that you can't charge while using the kickstand, so you'll either have to use a stand or just hold it while charging. And finally, it also has an accelerometer and gyroscope. Next up, we have the Joy-Cons. They're made of this smooth plastic similar to the console, and it feels good in hand, but after just a few weeks of use, we did start to see some wear. We got a near impossible to remove polished greasy stain on the right one, and no, we don't use it with dirty hands. So they connect via Bluetooth, and pairing them is extremely easy. You just attach them, and that's it. If you want to pair more controllers, you also have an additional option in settings, which is also very simple. Now, the way the Joy-Cons physically connect is via this rail system. It slides into the tracks on the console, grip, straps, or any other accessory. On the back of the Joy-Cons, we have a release button, so when you want to remove them, you hold it down and they slide right off. So what's on them? You have two rubber-coated analog sticks. The one on the right is a bit awkward to use due to its lower position. Then we have nice and clicky face buttons minus and plus buttons which work as start and select, small and thin R and L buttons, digital triggers that I wish were analog, and instead of a traditional D-pad, we have a split D-pad made up of four buttons. It's a necessary compromise, so when you use it as an individual controller, you'll still have your own face buttons. On the left Joy-Con, we have a capture button that works really fast and saves JPEGs in your album, which you can then share. Then on the right Joy-Con, you have the home button. Press it and it takes you to the home menu, hold it and you gain access to a quick settings panel where you can change brightness settings and toggle sleep mode and airplane mode. The last set of buttons are hidden in the rails. We have our sync button and the tiny left and right shoulder buttons for when we use the Joy-Cons as individual controllers. Both Joy-Cons also have an accelerometer and gyroscope for motion controls along with HD rumble. Then the right Joy-Con actually has a few more things than the left, and that is a motion IR camera, which helps identify things in front of it, and an NFC reader on the analog stick to use with Amiibos. As someone with big hands, I honestly don't think the Joy-Cons feel small when used together, but as individual controllers, they definitely begin to feel a bit cramped. You'll also notice the analog stick and buttons are pushed to one side, which makes them awkward to use, but it's easy to forgive when you consider that this allows you to play multiplayer wherever you are. Now, if you want to make the Joy-Cons feel more like a traditional controller, you can use the Joy-Con grip. This accessory makes them feel just about the same as when they are on the console, and it even reminds me of the GameCube's Waver controller. Finally, we have the Joy-Con straps. You line up the corresponding signs and slide them right on. They do two things. One, they make the shoulder buttons a bit bigger so they're easier to use, and two, they have to secure them from flying off when you're using motion controllers. Oh. This toaster looking thing is the dock. It's like a hub that charges your Switch along with a few additional outputs, but most importantly, it connects your Switch to a larger display. 
Behind this panel, there's ports for USB 3.0, HDMI, and the AC adapter. Then on this side, there's two USB 2.0 ports and the TV output LED to let us know if it's connected. The only thing missing is an ethernet port, but you can pick up a separate adapter for that. Once you hook up the cables, if the console's on, you dock it and it magically switches to your display. There's barely any delay and I'm still surprised as to how fast it works. Now when docked, the switch runs at a higher clock speed and goes from 720p up to 1080p and it outputs 5.1 surround sound as well. Emphasis on up to 1080p because Breath of the Wild, one of the leading launch titles straight from Nintendo, runs at 900p. Nonetheless, to my eyes it still looks really good, but of course it's nowhere near 4K. One thing to note, when on the dock, the console does run a little hot and some have even reported that their console has warped. Let's hope that's a few cases and not a lot. What makes the Switch different from other consoles is its play modes. Quickly go from a home console to a handheld or single player to multiplayer. This is where the console gets its name because it easily allows you to switch between modes. First up, for a traditional home console experience, we slide the Switch into the dock. This is TV mode. You detach the Joy-Cons and you can use them separately or with the grip and enjoy playing on a bigger display while the console charges in the dock. Then we have my favorite and that is handheld mode. The battery life is good enough for a normal play session, the layout can be a bit crammed together and that right joystick takes some getting used to, but overall this mode is the most convenient and that big screen is addicting to use. Finally, we pop out the kickstand and place it on any flat surface. This is tabletop mode. It works best for when you want to sit back and relax or play some multiplayer by using the Joy-Cons as individual controllers. Being that I use the Switch primarily in handheld mode, battery life is everything. The console has a 4310 milliamp battery that Nintendo says can last 2.5 to 6.5 hours depending on the games you play. For the most part, our test results correspond with that statement. When playing The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, we got about 3 hours of battery life, but with less graphically intense games such as Snipper Clips and The Binding of Isaac, the battery lasted 4 to 5 hours. Both results are pretty good for normal, real world situations. Now, when it comes to charging, it's a bit slow. Going from 0 to 100% took us about 3 long hours. On the plus side, having a USB-C charging port means you can use a portable charger to extend that battery life, if it's of course powerful enough. As for the Joy-Cons, well you're probably not going to have to worry about them. We've been using them for over a month now and not once did the battery ever go below 80%. That's because they have an approximate battery life of 20 hours and they charge when attached to the console, which is our primary way of using it. Inside the Nintendo Switch, we have an Nvidia Tegra X1 T210, 4 gigs of RAM, and there's 32 gigs of internal storage with about 6 gigs reserved for the system. That leaves us with only 26 gigs, so you're going to want a micro SD card. The Switch can take micro SD HC or XC cards of up to a future proof 2 terabytes, which we don't yet have. And after digging a little bit, I'd suggest to stick to UHS-1 standard SD cards because it seems the Nintendo Switch caps anything faster than those. As for game performance, Breath of the Wild looks gorgeous and runs really well on the Switch, but that's not to say it's perfect. Every once in a while we did notice frame drops, mostly when there's a lot of foliage or environmental effects, and it's even more obvious in TV mode when it jumps from 720p to 900p. It struggles a bit, but then other games such as Super Bomberman R, Snipper Clips, and The Binding of Isaac play just about perfectly. So clearly the graphics aren't next gen, but they're still very good, and it's up to developers to make the best of them, which I hope they do. The UI design on the Switch is very modern. Everything is well laid out and organized, it's simple, it's clean. Up here we can access our player page. In it, you can customize your icon, check play activity, you have your friends list, and a few more settings. Back to the homepage. Your games show up nice and big right in the middle and below that we have some options. There's news, albums, a few system settings, as well as the eShop. Currently, it's getting more populated week by week, but it's still bare bones in terms of navigation. I'm sure that they'll be updating it soon, but as of right now, we only have recent releases, coming soon, the latest edition, best sellers, and we can of course search. Now, if you hold down the home button wherever you are, a quick settings tab comes up. 
You can see the time, your connection status, and battery the same as the home page, but it also lets you put the console to sleep, change brightness settings, and switch on airplane mode. So there's a lot to like here. I appreciate their restraint with the overall UI design, but right now it feels slightly empty, which can come off a bit uninviting. Nonetheless, I'm sure it'll get better with time. The Nintendo Switch doesn't come with a game, but I did want to show you how the game cards look. As you can tell, they're very tiny, they're light, and easy to lose. They come in these nice slick little cases that don't take up much space, and sadly there's not much in them because no one really prints manuals anymore. Now the problem is that they cost more to manufacture, and developers have to price their games the same regardless if it's a box copy or digital. So this makes games more expensive for us. In fact, we're seeing some games out there sell for over $10 more than it does on other platforms. That's a problem and I'm hoping with time those prices will even out a little bit. If that's not bad enough, they also taste terrible. You may have heard that Nintendo said a bitter agent has also been applied to the game card to avoid the possibility of accidental ingestion. And it's actually a very smart solution. I did not want to eat this when I tasted it. I actually have a lot of pros and cons, but I'm going to only mention the highlights. This will primarily be about the hardware because the software will change and evolve in the coming months as new updates are released along with new games. So let's start off with pros. First up, construction. Although it's made of mostly plastic, it all feels very solid and I'm sure it can withstand an accidental drop here and there. Graphics. For a hybrid device, it's pretty impressive and everyone I've shown Breath of the Wild to so far agrees. The Joy-Cons, they feel good, they work well, the battery life is fantastic, but most importantly, they're two in one, so you can use them as individual controllers for on the spot multiplayer. Play modes, play on your big screen in TV mode, play on the bus in handheld mode, play at work with your boss in tabletop mode. The console works to suit multiple situations. And finally, it's modular. I haven't heard many people say much about this, but being that it's made up of multiple pieces, Nintendo can potentially update parts throughout time like a PC. Think of new Joy-Cons, a pro version or one with a D-pad. They can even upgrade the console itself with better hardware and sell it on its own for a lower price. That alone gives this console a crazy amount of potential. Now for cons, starting with battery life for the console. Clearly the more the better, but what we have is two to three hours with graphically intense games. It's not terrible, but I wish it was better. Charging port location. Because it's at the bottom, we can't charge the console while using the kickstand, but it's there so we can connect it to the dock for TV mode. It's a compromise, but easy to work around with a stand or by simply holding it. And as I mentioned, the kickstand. Although I appreciate how it snaps off instead of breaking, I wish it was wider because on its own, it's just not that stable. It's pretty flimsy. Then there's performance. Navigating the UI works buttery smooth. Indie games play really well, but I can't help but feel a bit nervous as to how the leading launch title, Breath of the Wild, sometimes struggles on this system. And then finally, digital triggers. The Joy-Cons are filled with some awesome tech, but no analog triggers. I, I just don't get that. Analog triggers offer more options, which is why they've become the norm in almost every controller out there. And let's not forget that having them would have made it easier for Nintendo to port GameCube games into the virtual console. All things considered, in my opinion, the reason I believe the Nintendo Switch will be successful is because it delivers on its concept. Here we have a versatile hybrid console with multiple modes that gives consumers options. Options which a normal console experience simply doesn't offer, and that's exactly the niche that Nintendo has carved out for itself in this market. Yes, it does have some shortcomings, and there are more questions that need to be answered, but nonetheless, this still makes for a very strong foundation for what is a console in its infancy. We think it's got a ton of potential, so what about you guys? Love it? Hate it? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Next up, we have an accessories video, so we'll see you for the next box. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video and want to help us out, you can do so by clicking that thumbs up button. And while you're at it, why not subscribe for more content? It's free. We also love to hear you out, so please leave a comment down below or talk with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Sergio IM, and I'll see you for the next